Good afternoon and welcome to day seven of Energy Finance 2021 online. I'm Sandy Buchanan, Executive Director of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Our session today is entitled Storage, the Key to the Grid of the Future. Before we get started, let me explain how our question and answer session will work. You see a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Please feel free to put your questions in there and our moderator will relay those to our speakers. You can also use the chat box to interact with other conference attendees. Now I'm pleased to introduce Julia Prochnik who will moderate today's session. Julia is the Executive Director of the Long Duration Energy Storage Association of California, where she promotes long-term storage as a solution for grid reliability and meeting climate goals. Julia has held a number of private and public sector positions where she's focused on grid operations, transmission, planning, and equity advocacy. She lives in San Francisco. Now, let me turn this over to Julia to get us started. Hi, Sandy, thank you so much. It's great to be here and I'm, I'm thrilled to talk about storage today with such an esteemed panel. Really wanna thank you and Aifa for hosting this event and I hope that all of the attendees will go and look at all the previous sessions. They've been outstanding. I really enjoyed the keynote from Michael where he highlighted the transition and where we're going around the world and in the United States. And I liked his scissor analogy. So I'll leave it as that to test you and kind of treat you to go back and watch it. I also was really impressed by the slides about just how, how far we've come and how the costs are really dropping for solar, for storage, for wind. And what was interesting was seeing that the costs dropped from 17 cents a kilowatt hour to one cent a kilowatt hour for solar, and that the same trajectory is happening for storage. So we're really excited to dive into more details today. Look forward to our panelists. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you again. And I just wanted to introduce both Arjun Flora, who is the Director of Energy Finance Studies Europe, he is based in UK and he is an analyst focused on energy transition in Europe. He has worked in energy technology investment banking at Alexa Capital and Jefferies in London and holds a master's degree in engineering from the University of Cambridge. We also have Stephen Prince. Stephen is a senior advisor at Alexa Capital and responsible for the expansion in North America. He brings over two decades of leadership experience of corporates and growth strategy, energy and technology companies. He holds an accounting degree from California State University in Bachelor's of Science and a Master's in Tax from Golden Gate University. Thank you both so much for speaking today and I will hand it over to our first presentation. Hello everybody. I'd like to talk to you today about energy storage. Energy storage is crucial for our electricity grid of the future. Without it, we really will not be able to realize the vision of a zero emissions energy system. However, it's a complex topic which can quickly become quite technical. So in this presentation, I'd really like to provide an introduction. I'll be addressing questions like what is storage? Why do we need more of it? And is there a role for campaigners going forwards? So what is energy storage? Well, let's start with some real life examples. On the left of the slide, you can see a large pumped hydro facility, which effectively operates like a giant rechargeable battery for the electricity grid. At times of excess power, water is pumped up to the reservoir where it's stored, then when needed, it can flow back down to generate electricity. On the right of the slide, we have the inside of a battery power plant. Here we can see physical rats of batteries that can charge and discharge power when needed to help stabilize the grid. These are just two examples of what storage can look like in practice, and we'll come back to different technologies later. But why do we need energy storage at all in our grid? Why is it so crucial? Well, you can think of the grid really like a bridge between energy supply or generation on one side and demand or consumption on the other. Supply and demand are both variable quantities and change throughout the days, hours, and months of the year. This illustration shows how energy can be captured and stored when there's low demand on the left of the chart, for example, early in the morning before most people get up. This stored energy can then be released later on in the day during periods of higher demand. Using storage in this way avoids the need for additional generation capacity to be built. Supply and demand are also distributed geographically. So energy needs to be moved through space as well as time. 
In this case, energy storage can be deployed near bottlenecks in the network to ease congestion and avoid additional build out of transmission or distribution capacity. Flexibility is the key to managing fluctuations in supply and demand. But why do we need more storage on the grid going forwards? Well, the transition of the power sector means that we're going to rely more and more on variable generation from renewables. What does this mean for the grid? Well, here we have some illustrative generation profiles of wind and solar power. You can see how much they vary, and their peaks don't line up with daily or seasonal demand peaks, which are shown shaded in darker gray. These supply-side fluctuations from solar and wind generation need to be smoothed out, and energy storage is an important tool to solve this. Globally, we're undergoing a huge energy transition. The International Energy Agency, or IEA, for the first time this year acknowledged the massive increase in renewables penetration that's needed if we are to get to net zero by 2050. The chart on this slide is taken from that report and shows an expected increase in solar and wind penetration from just 10% last year to about 70% globally by 2050. This massive global shift to renewables also requires greater stabilization of the grid via a range of ancillary services such as frequency control. So that's the supply side. But on top of that, we also have an energy transition on the demand side. We're seeing greater electrification and digitization of end users, such as transport, heating, and cooking. The chart on the right, again from the IEA, suggests that electric vehicle sales will increase 18-fold this decade alone. That's a big shift in demand from off-grid gasoline and diesel to electric charging from the grid. Now, all this electrification ultimately translates to more and bigger fluctuations in demand. And these need to be actively balanced on the grid by flexibility from energy storage. So it's clear that we need to install more storage capacity. But just how much more? Well, the short answer is a lot more. Research firm IHS Market forecasts a doubling of power capacity installations this year and compound annual growth of 18% this decade. They expect almost 30 gigawatts will be installed in 2030, which is six times what was installed last year. Another research firm, Wood Mackenzie, expects 31% compound annual growth this decade. And they measure energy capacity installations and expect growth from below 50 gigawatt hours to over 700 gigawatt hours in 2030. That's 14 times bigger. So whichever way you look at it, it's a huge uptick, especially when you consider that last year was a record-breaking year for installations. It really emphasizes how storage is a nascent market, which rapidly needs to mature and grow as part of the energy transition. Now, IHS and Wood Mackenzie have used two different measures for storage capacity there, power and energy. And that's because storage is measured in different ways depending on how it's being used. And this is when storage becomes more complex. We can think of energy in a storage system like water in a bottle. Using this analogy, the total energy held is proportional to the size of the bottle or the volume of water. And when the bottle is emptied, the power being generated is proportional to the size of the mouth or how quickly the water can flow out of the bottle. This is because power measures the rate of transfer of energy. So in this way, energy storage systems have two rated capacities, power and energy. On this slide, I've summarized some key parameters that are used when comparing storage systems. And you can see at the top, power and energy. And if you divide one by the other, this gives us another important metric, which is discharge time or duration, here measured in hours. This is how long the storage system can continue transferring its rated power before it runs out and needs to be recharged, which is very important. Some grid applications require higher energy and longer durations, while others require higher power, but only for a few seconds or minutes at a time. Other parameters are also important. Response time is how quickly a system can deliver its rated power which can be critical for some use cases. Efficiency and lifetime are also very important because they directly impact the economics. Now, economics is the single most important driver of adoption for any capable technology, and I'll come back to that later. But first, coming back to power and duration. On this slide, there's an illustration that shows how some storage technologies fit in terms of duration and power. So on this chart, duration increases as you go up the vertical axis, and power capacity increases as you move to the right. This is a simplified picture. In reality, there are more subcategories and technologies. And if you look online, you'll find many different variations of this chart. But here, I'd like to highlight two points. Firstly, 
Over the last decade, lithium iron, which is shown here in dark blue, has really come from nowhere to take over as the most popular technology for shorter duration applications. I'll come back to this, but the key point is that this trend is set to continue. Lithium iron really does have that segment covered going forwards. However, lithium iron is not well suited for longer durations of say six or eight hours plus, which means we have a problem. The growing need for long duration storage needs to be solved by a new technology. Historically, pumped hydro is the dominant technology globally for storing large amounts of energy for long periods of time. It still represents over 90% of European energy storage capacity today. However, there are clear physical and environmental constraints. We can't simply build reservoirs everywhere and flood the land. Compressed air energy storage, another mature technology, requires fossil gas to be burnt as part of the process and suffers similar physical constraints as air is stored underground in salt caverns or purpose-built containers. Flow batteries are a promising solution, but have so far been too immature and expensive to deploy at scale. The production of renewable hydrogen has been touted as one possible solution for long duration storage, though it's also expensive, immature, and has very low efficiencies. So that's the technology. I also mentioned earlier that economics is the real driver for scale adoption. Favorable economics require low costs. So that includes upfront capex, ongoing OPEX, as well as capital costs. And these need to be recouped reasonably quickly through future revenues. So to attract investment, it's important that revenues are as visible and predictable as possible. And this is really where storage has struggled. Technology costs have been high and the revenue streams are not always clear or predictable, even if the technical benefits are there. For that link to occur between the technical benefits and the economic there needs to be a suitable market or regulatory framework that compensates the storage assets or the systems for the benefits that they provide, whether that's increased flexibility, deferral of network investment, ancillary services, or other benefits. So let me give an example. Frequency control is an important ancillary service. The grid frequency needs to be kept within a certain bandwidth for our appliances to work, whether that's 50 hertz or 60 hertz. And this requires active management, which can be done using fast response, high power technologies, like batteries. In 2016, the UK grid operator National Grid launched its Enhanced Frequency Response Mechanism, or EFR, which offered four-year contracts to winning storage projects for sub-second frequency response services. That made provided a route to market for several battery power plants by enabling them to secure financing and kick-started the market so that two years later, all eight winning projects had been built and entered operation. So I mentioned earlier that lithium-ion has taken over short-duration applications. This is because lithium-ion battery costs have fallen by 87% over the last decade, as you can see on this chart. Lithium-ion is a multi-billion dollar technology, which benefits from global research and investment into not one, but three verticals. Consumer electronics, automobiles or electric vehicles, and stationary energy storage. Over the coming decade, we're going to see a huge wave of lithium-ion installations, driven by even lower costs and big expansions of production capacities from the so-called gigafactories of the global EV market. Combined with the fact that batteries can be programmed to perform multiple functions and generate more revenue, which is known as revenue stacking, this explains why they're set to dominate future installations. Hydrogen, I mentioned earlier, has gained much political momentum and media attention over the last year as a possible clean fuel of the future and is benefiting from huge investment. In the context of grid storage, the concept is that excess renewable electricity can be used in the future to produce hydrogen from the electrolysis of water. This can then be stored for long periods of time and converted back into electricity when needed, either by burning in a turbine or by using fuel cells. However, while hydrogen can be stored, it has one major disadvantage for this application. In the table on this slide, you can see that using hydrogen is by far the least efficient option when compared to other long duration technologies. This effectively means that hydrogen production costs will have to come down a long way before it's competitive. The coming decade will be a development race between hydrogen and all the other long duration technologies to see who can bring down costs and demonstrate large scale feasibility. And lastly, I just wanted to raise the question, is there a role for campaigners going forwards? Where do campaigners fit in? To date, energy storage has not been a subject for campaigns or activism, but this may well change in the future. For example, reciprocating gas engines are often used 
in the US and elsewhere as a major source of power flexibility, as are gas peaker plants or OCGTs. In addition, these facilities can often be sited in lower income areas. As we progress with decarbonisation, this will definitely need to change. There also needs to be a balance of narratives in the public. Hydrogen is a good example of this, where the gas industry marketing campaigns really need to be balanced out and scrutinised. Lastly, work is required at the policy level to support the creation of energy storage markets around the world. With that, we've come to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much for tuning in. I've put together a handful of slides to explain a little bit about the basic topology around energy storage, the energy storage value chain, where the growth is coming from, as well as obstacles to adoption. When we talk about topology, there's basically five main energy storage deployment types that impact the grid of the future. And just wanna make the point that low cost renewables and longer duration batteries or longer duration storage solutions are key to enabling energy storage in the future. And you can see from the diagram, we cover off photovoltaics at a grid scale level, number one, wind at a grid scale level, whether it be onshore or offshore, number two, energy storage that basically gets integrated into the transmission distribution network at a substation level and performs a host of ancillary services. And then of course, behind the meter, we can talk about commercial industrial customers, or small medium enterprises or residential customers. We'll talk more about that as we go through the deck. The next slide, I introduce the notion of the value chain and some insights that come from it. And I think what's important to note is when you think about an energy storage solution, there are these micro segments of how it gets delivered as a solution. And in particular, if we're talking about energy storage, solutions in North America. These are the eight primary micro segments of that value chain. And so you have providers that participate singularly in that value chain, or they combine that value chain. Why this becomes important is the adoption and the risk to more rapid adoption can be directly tied to the integration of the value chain and the risk associated with the performance or the pricing implications of having the value chain segmented where each subcomponent requires margin. So when you look at this example, battery manufacturers are starting to provide inverters and they're also acting as integrators. You can look at SunGrow that does that and effectively provide the inverter, the battery, and they integrate it into a box. And then some of these aggregators and software providers are being combined with the first three columns that you see in this value chain. So as those players integrate more pieces of the value chain, there's more room to reduce costs because you're not doing margin on each segment and it reduces the risk of the ultimate integrated solution. So I think you'll see large players integrate across this value chain, dropping the price and reducing the risk. As we move to the next slide, it just reinforces how low cost renewables and longer duration solutions are really driving growth in the segment. And so you can see on the slide on the left, how both solar and wind have become less expensive than traditional carbon-based generation. And as a result of that, the need for energy storage becomes more and more clear. Literally, you can't deal with the intermittency of the wind or the sun and have reliable and resiliency integrated into the grid, which creates additional demand for the storage. The second slide uh, really gives you an idea of how the levelized cost of storage against these duration requirements and how it drives adoption as well. As we move to the next slide, the point is as excited as we get about storage and what's coming, and how vibrant the market is, you get a sense of how small it is today and how immature it is today versus where it will ultimately go and the significance of its integration into the grid. 
And just to give you a statistic, in the United States, there was more battery energy storage solutions put into the ground than there were in the prior seven years. So that's how quickly that J curve has grown. It only accelerates beyond that. You also get a sense of the diversity of the implementation of energy storage and how it plays out at a grid scale and behind the meter. As we go to the next slide, the forecast for the growth, and you get a sense of what it looks like at a macro level regionally and more at a micro level, and it's 10X over the next decade. That is just phenomenal growth. And just to give you an idea, in the US, it's actually 14X. So 10X on a global basis, 14X at the level of growth in the United States. And you can see that distribution on these charts. When we look at what's driving regional growth and what's creating this demand, it's really quite diverse and it differs by region. So in the United States, it's very much been around the penetration of renewable assets onto the grid and specifically in those regions that allow for renewable penetration just because of the physical attributes and the governance and the ability to basically have renewable penetration exist and for battery energy storage to coexist. And so grid scale in California, Texas in the Northeast, and most certainly in California, very rapid adoption behind the meter by residential customers. You're required to put solar on your home for new construction in California. And if you're gonna put solar on your home in California, you're gonna combine it with a battery, with the incentives and the desire for resiliency, with all of the, you know, all the problems that they've experienced across their grid. In Latin America, huge, huge adoption in Chile, driven predominantly by AES's portfolio, huge hydro plant in Chile, and they deployed massive amounts of storage to create the solution required for that particular grid environment. Unfortunately, in Mexico, renewable uh, development's been stymied a bit by the new president that's protecting traditional generation resources and the economics around them. And then when you look at Colombia, they have transmission infrastructural issues that storage solves and eliminates the time and the cost of implementing large transmission assets. Asia is a fantastic story, quite diverse. China driven by renewable plus storage, they actually have constructs that allow for frequency regulation, pay for performance, which really increases adoption and improves the business case. In India, the distribution system operators are asking the IPPs to bid with intermittency issues solved. They're not taking responsibility for that intermittency. So if you're gonna put in renewable assets in India, you're gonna put storage alongside it. Of course, in Japan, I think is an interesting instance where the residential customers in Japan, one of the most brisk markets for behind the meter, implemented a lot of solar under incentives, and now they're looking for resiliency. And as a result of that, they wanna have storage in their homes. EMEA is a fantastic story, particularly in the UK for grid scale storage. They have some of the largest plants in the world because they're able to monetize the ancillary services in that particular market. And it's been very favorable for energy storage. Germany has had large adoption at a residential level behind the meter. You think about Sonen and what they were able to achieve. And as they adopt more and more electric vehicles, at-home charging, pricing differential, you're gonna see a lot more storage deployed. And of course, in Africa, in South Africa in particular, where there's a lot of mining and remote mining taking place and people are trying to achieve resiliency, net zero targets, long duration, Vanadium flow batteries have really emerged out of that market and become quite, quite reliable as a result of those implementations. Interesting thing about Korea, 29 fires over the last three years. So that's really impacted the, the implementation of lithium ion in particular in that market. When we look at obstacles to adoption, I'm just going to cover them at a high level. And I wanted to remind everybody of the diversity of the technologies, in particular, the physical attributes of some of these solutions. If you're gonna put in hydro storage or compressed air at scale, you have to have water available for pumped hydro. And that's something that you know you can't do everywhere. Water is obviously becoming a commodity that has a very, very 
high value, especially if it's potable. And then compressed air, a lot of the scale solutions require large caverns, uh, physical uh, geographical attributes that allow you to store it in the ground. But if we get beyond that, really the adoption is driven by economics. And so as economics improve around the price of batteries, improve around the price of electrolyte, if you're talking about flow, uh, this all improves the chances of more rapid adoption. Government subsidies absolutely have been a large part of uh, implementations historically, those subsidies are going to continue. To the extent they get discontinued, it impacts the ability to increase the adoption of energy storage. And of course, any market that allows for ancillary services and the attributes of these energy storage solutions and allows for the modification of those particular attributes improves the business case. One of the biggest hurdles to adoption, particularly in the US, and some other markets is the ability just to get an interconnection agreement with the local utility and achieving those approvals. Those processes can take 18 to 24 months. So as you think about this as ad advocates for the technology, improving the processes and the requirements to get these assets approved goes a long, long way. The two you know, other areas of risk that are impeding more rapid implementation really go down to technology risk. We talked a little bit about lithium ion and fires. You know, if we have problems with fires at lithium ion battery energy storage deployments, it directly impacts the implementation. New York City adopted uh, measures that didn't allow for battery energy storage solutions for quite some time until they were comfortable with uh, fire suppression. There are still health and safety concerns around the flow battery technologies and whether the byproduct of the electrolyte is safe and what happens, will there be an environmental disaster? And then I think the last point I would make is bankability of projects is absolutely critical. So implemented solutions that perform as projected, that do so without creating uh, public health and safety concerns, that has to happen for multiple years before the low cost of capital will come into the market. So it's really important that these technologies get implemented, they perform as projected, and they perform without material incident. When that occurs, lower cost of capital comes to bear, and we have rapid, rapid adoption. With that said, I look forward to your questions and further conversation on the topic. Thank you. Hi, welcome back everyone. What great presentations from Steven and Arjun. Thank you so much. I'd also like to welcome Dennis. He's with us joining our panel. He is an analyst and editor and he's covered energy and environmental policy and technology for over 30 years. He's the former editor of the Energy Daily, a Washington DC based newsletter. Welcome Dennis. Thank you, Julia. I'm happy to be here. Great. So there's been some great questions coming in the chat. Um, I'm going to weave some of them into some of the questions I have for the panelists, and then please keep the questions coming. So Arjun and Steven, you both brought up in your presentations the importance of flexibility and the need for diversity. And what I was noticing, too, is that in the one of the slides that you had, Arjun, you highlighted a bunch of technologies um, for both short duration and long duration and wanted to know that there's a few more that we could add. And, and I think the great thing is the market continue will bring more technologies and ideas to the marketplace. One is concentrating solar power with thermal storage. Another one is zinc batteries. They could also be as flow batteries. I mean, just the expansion of batteries in general is gonna you know, broaden in the next few years. And then also liquid air technologies. So it's great to, to see this you know, noteworthy information being shared, but also that there's a lot of great technologies in the marketplace now and that are coming forward. So, so thanks for noting that. And a question to both of you is, um, you know, on the diversity element and kind of what else is needed for that flexibility. Arjun, can you dive in a little bit more into that for us, please? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Julia, and, and hello, hello to everybody watching. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, so so on, on the point of diversity, one thing that I didn't go into in my presentation um, is, is the long list of applications and, and use cases really for energy storage. Um, 
Uh, and really that's because, well, it, it's, it's too long and also frankly, it gets a bit boring and a bit technical. Um, for, for, for those of you that are interested, you can go to, um, for example, you can go to the EAS website, that's the European uh, Association for the Storage of Energy. And there there's a document that you can download and they, they list, I think about 40 different applications, you know, with a small description um, for energy storage. And so, so we're not gonna go through all of them, but what we can do is we can bucket them, we can group them um, by where they are deployed on the grid. Um, and I think Stephen in his presentation had, had a really great diagram, um, which I thought was really good at visualizing this um, on the electricity grid. So, so you've got the front of the meter applications where storage is acting you know, as generation or alongside generation, um, such as helping to meet you know, demand peaks or, or doing energy arbitrage or offering ancillary services to the grid. But then you also have applications along the transmission infrastructure and, and the distribution infrastructure where storage can be used to, to defer investment and, and to bring down costs effectively uh, for the consumer. And then of course there's behind the meter application. So this is, we're really talking about the customer side. Um, and here again, there's, there's various different applications, but really ultimately we're talking about two things, you know, either reducing energy bills for, it could be commercial and industrial consumers, you know, running factories, um, or it could be residential customers as well. Um, so, so reducing energy bills um, or ensuring a certain level of reliability and resilience, you know, a certain quality of electricity that, that let's say a factory requires uh, to run uh, economically. Um, so so th those are kind of uh, different areas of applications. And obviously each of these applications has certain technical requ requirements. They operate in different economic uh, environments. They have different regulatory um, uh, blocks um, or, or issues. And, and so it makes sense for us to have a diversity of technologies um, um, to, to tackle this, this uh, solution because it's, it's really a, a massive task, um, this, this whole, this, this huge energy transition we're going through. Um, and so we need to be making progress in all of those areas. Thanks, Arjun. Stephen, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I just say a couple things. Look, I always look at the customer when I try to answer questions like these, and Arjun has covered a lot of this off. You know, we talk about the energy transition when we talk about storage. Net zero has definitely driven a change to the speed and the nature of these solutions, in that there's no the we no longer have a radial design. It's very difficult to have a radial grid design with a net zero agenda because you've basically got to distribute power generation typically around solar, wind, and other uh, you know, renewable resources. And it's that change in design that's pushing the responsibilities for not only power production, but power quality out to others. And so when Arjun talks about in front of the meter, behind the meter, you know, in front of the meter typically is done by a utility or for a utility most of the time. And that's really not a big change, um, but the distri distribution of the assets has changed because of the change in the design of the grid. And so what's happening is traditional vertically integrated or, uh, or deregulated utilities are being forced to use distributed resources and distributed storage. And that's what's kind of driving that adoption. And in doing so, those utilities are very familiar with the ancillary services, all the power quality issues, all of those things as they solve the problem. So they're seeking and looking aggressively for solutions that are cost effective and deal with this new grid design. When you, so when you talk about a different customer class like Argent did and you go and look at the CNI customers, now this has gotten really dynamic for them. It used to be they had a radial design, the traditional design, the centralized power plants, they had a pretty good idea that they were going to get power quality and they were going to get it consistently. And they didn't really have to fret about it too much. And the prices were pretty much fixed. But all of that changed with the change in the grid design. So what's happening is the customers are now becoming more responsible and more accountable for power quality and power supply. If any of you are in California, you understand that in spades, right? Because of the outages and everything else. Don't think those things are occurring only in California. Anytime you change your grid design, you go from radial to distributed, 
it's going to have anomalies. And so commercial industrial customers are taking more responsibility for their operating environment. And by the way, they're learning that if they take a different energy attitude towards energy and these microgrids that they're now allowed to put on the grid, they can actually make energy an asset and, and meet the ESG goals that they've set and actually make money by providing better power quality resiliency to themselves and helping the community they're in have a better grid as well. So the fantastic news is the convergence of our ESG goals and the grid redesign are creating an incredible opportunity for energy storage and it's being driven by the customers. Great point. So I, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing up kind of the, how everything is interconnected because we have so much to do and so much to scale up to meet our net zero goals. I mean, the climate goals are, you know, both the United States and international and we need everything. We need short-term batteries and long-term batteries. And the question is, is what is long duration energy storage? Like what, what does this look like? And so, you know, there, there's kind of this, this sweet spot of, of 10 hours is kind of the, this is truly long duration, but it's not, it's just the beginning because so many technologies can have a duration of, of you know, 24 hours or multi-day or even seasonal, you know, ensuring that they are providing these ancillary services of resource adequacy, spinning reserve, sub-second response time, um, frequency control, the discharge time and response time, you know, how much can you do for black star capability? You know, what is synchronous generation and how can we do with, with spinning reserves and operating reserves? Long duration energy storage can do this in a variety of ways. And the point to Arjun that made about the diversity element is that, but you need both behind the meter and in front of the meter, um, you know, whether it's, you know, helping repurpose gas plants in disadvantaged communities with new types of storage and, and clean energy power, or whether it's, you know, utility scale where you can have wind and solar with storage together. So you really do need to kind of see whether, you know, there's certain environmental footprints of, you know, you can have pumped hydro here and storage, you can have, you know, liquid air here, you can have constant solar power, which I wanted to address um, Cassandra's question. We put in the website, uh, the, in the chat box, a link to a website where the U.S. Department of Energy and CSB thermal companies talk about the benefits, same with zinc batteries, um, same with lots of different technologies. They, they all have attributes that are important to kind of digest more. And I also wanted um, to ask Stephen a little bit more about the environmental footprint and kind of supply chain. This also came up from a question from Amy um, about raw materials and, you know, how does this kind of play into what is the environmental next steps or kind of the overall nexus for how you balance you know, the, the different components of supply chain with environment and decreasing emissions? Yeah, so that's a that's a really complex question and it's a very valid one. You know, I, <clears throat> I've been doing this for probably close to a decade and was, a, was the CEO of a company that was a pioneer in this space with lithium ion. And I can tell you in the early days, the, the physics of the solutions were driving what was being created and produced as people saw uh, photovoltaics and wind starting to get a greater market share. So basically companies were just trying to find resources that would allow them to store energy uh, under an electrical grid scheme. And they probably weren't thinking as much about, you know, rare earth minerals and, and uh, volatility of elements and uh, public safety items. It's not that they don't care about them. They were trying to solve the physical problem, right? And so what came out of that is lithium ion was a very, very um, effective material to build batteries with. And it had the qualities and, and there was plenty of it available to, to take on uh, lithium ion batteries. And they were already in existence for laptops, cell phones, and other things. The question was, could it be used for grid scale? And I will tell you in the last probably four or five years, sensitivity to the core materials uh, has increased dramatically. One, just because you know we're using rare earth minerals. If we focus on lithium ion, and we have magnesium, cobalt, nickel, maybe some zinc in those mm -hmm. in those batteries, and they're all rare earth uh, minerals. And and then on top of that, with the and I think I'm not choosing one company in particular on purpose, but without question, Tesla's move into you know electric vehicles and batteries and then what sub subsequently has happened at a grid scale has really put a lot of pressure on 
lithium ion and its dependency on rare earth minerals. And it's actually become a political topic. So, um, you know, as countries and large companies try to secure access to those rare earth minerals, there's very extreme political implications uh, for the countries that are doing that. And I have to be honest, the United States has been slow to look at um, the sub elements of these technologies as a strategic resource, but they've definitely woken up under Biden and <clears throat> they're now making decisions around how they finance companies and they finance these activities to make sure they secure these critical rare earth minerals, not just for ESG goals, but for other, you know, uh, defense related goals and whatnot. But if you move past lithium ion, <clears throat> first of all, Customers do care and they've become very aware of it for a host of reasons. One, just availability and the impact it has on the countries that possess those minerals. It's been very, you would assume if a country has something that's about high value, that it's gonna be constructive and it's gonna improve their economy and their lifestyles. But if you go to Africa, that's not always what's happened. And they're one of the countries that has a lot of these rare earth minerals as well as you know South America. And unfortunately, the way this plays out, it doesn't always, doesn't always happen with equality and a sense of uh, social equality that people would like. So there's a focus on that element, but then there's another focus just related to health and safety. So if you look at lithium ion, to be very literal with you, you know, for a long time, up until a couple of years ago, you couldn't put a lithium ion battery into New York City. There were fire codes that prevented it because of its volatility. And you know, those concerns have dropped dramatically since there's been better fire suppression and there's better packaging and other things. So it's not just the supply chain, but how that supply chain gets used. If we move beyond lithium ion and we look at flow, you know, one of the most prolific flow battery technologies, is vanadium. And vanadium is not definitely not uh, as volatile from a, a, a explosive standpoint, but it does have elements uh, that, you know, require health and safety concerns and uh, you know monitoring. And the source of the vanadium, it's also a, in a relatively short supply compared to other general elements. And so one of the things that people have focused on in that regard is can it be reused and can it be recycled? So I was just with a company last week in Vienna and they are using their vanadium electrolyte for the third time with three different applications. So what's happening is vendors are really trying to figure out how to keep their costs down and, and minimize the impact to the source of those materials. And so what's happening is there's a lot of recycling. So you may or may not know uh, a large percentage of lead acid batteries are recycled. They get recycled. Now in lithium ions case, it's somewhere between 25% and 96%, depending on how you characterize it. They definitely repurpose the batteries in their form but the processes to recycle the raw materials, the core materials is quite immature. But I think all of you should know that there's a lot of money being poured into recycling and repurposing. And a lot of it's being financed by not just the companies, but the government. So everybody's super conscious of this. And at the end of the day, the vendors, the buyers, the customers are all focused on how to do this responsibly and meet the ESG goals that are set forth. Thank you, Stephen. And I'm noticing a ton of questions and I'd like to get through a lot of them. So we're going to be succinct if it, <laughs> on our answers. There's so much to say about storage. We're all so excited. This could go on for three days and seasonal too. So <laughs> I'm very excited. So we have a, a question about the, um, from Lewis, the, the volcano in Iceland started erupting and has there been, um, any thoughts about adding geothermal or can, you know, what's happening with volcanoes and geothermal energy? And one thing would I would like add. To answer that? Go ahead, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, no, just real quick. Look, geothermal as an energy source has been around a very long time. Yeah. It's quite mature. Um, the issue with geothermal is it has to be consistent in terms of its heat and its pressure. And so uh, an erupting volcano is probably not as consistent, at least initially as people would like, but uh, there are companies that are searching out geothermal opportunities every day, and they very much are in existence. You'd be surprised how much exists in California alone. 
and the whole Salton Sea Initiative to kind of bring up more geothermal and tie it to lithium ion is a big initiative, as well as in Nevada, Northern California, and geothermal is 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 coming up to be another and booming industry. The other um, question I want to oh go ahead, Dennis, please. Yeah. I was just going to the Department of Energy is actually putting a lot of money into what they call enhanced geothermal, which is essentially trying to repurpose the technology developed through fracking, but to allow um, uh, to fracture rocks underground so you can use the heat of the rocks as opposed to having to have a liquid subsurface. So there's a, a potential down the road for a, a great expansion of the availability of geothermal in non-traditional geothermal regions. So th there's there's a lot of very cool research and there is new money going into this. So there's, there's a lot of potential down the road. And I, I, I think that's a great point about the, the need to put the money in the regulatory policies, you know, the, the updates of technology, you know, the, the push in California with the procurement for over a thousand megawatts of geothermal and a thousand megawatts of long duration energy storage. Like we need more of those signals. So that goes to another question from Meredith at the Energy Foundation. Um, what do you see as the key regulatory barriers to long duration battery storage? Arjun, do you want to start? Sure, sure. Well, this, this, is, this is a really great question. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's the key issue, really. So, so if if I could just take the UK as an example. So the UK is considered, um, I guess, a leading market uh, within Europe. Um, Germany is maybe a leader, you know, on the continent. Um, but the UK is, is, I'd say, a couple of years ahead of that. Um, and we have we have two dedicated um, energy storage funds uh, listed in the UK. Uh, Gore, Gore Street Capital and, and Gresham House, which um, are, have, have, have dedicated and investors are, are committed, uh, have, uh, are taking a bet here on energy storage as an asset class. Um, and but so so but what I'm trying to say here is that even though though this is the case in the UK with energy storage, this is still really short duration we're talking about. This is this is all lithium ion technology. This is primarily frequency control. Um, or playing into intraday markets, uh, day ahead markets. Um, and in the UK as well, there's triad avoidance, which is the avoidance of, ne of network charges. But, but this is all, all shorter duration. Um, and so long duration is really just kicking off. And I think I think a few months ago in the UK, the, uh, the REA, uh, which is like a, a trade association for renewable energy and, and clean technology in the UK, um, published a report calling on the government, calling on, on Ofgem, which is the, the UK regulator, to really put in place some kind of market mechanism um, that will support the build out of long duration. Because the problem is at the moment, there just, they just isn't the, the kind of market support there that, that can justify the, 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 the upfront capital costs. Um, there's not the visibility that can, that can provide some kind of revenue you know, certainty to investors, at least over a few years. Um, so what we've seen happening over the last kind of five years uh, the shorter duration side really needs to, to kick in and, and start to happen for longer duration. Dennis, yeah, you know, I just real quick, I'd say I, I really don't, in the US, I don't see regulatory hurdles as much as, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to business case and, and market circumstances. And I think effectively for long duration to make sense is you've got to basically have high renewable penetration. And once you get to the higher levels of, of renewable penetration, I think the business cases play out uh, very, very effectively for long duration storage. And so I, I think uh, you'll see barriers come down and I think you'll see long duration storage start to get adopted very rapidly in markets like New York, uh, Texas, and California. Um, the, the other issue is how do you finance this asset class and for the business cases to work, you have to have low cost of capital. And the truth of the matter is until the, the, the solutions get installed and they get commissioned and the financiers, the low cost of capital can see that they're reliable and consistent, the cost to put those assets in the ground is higher than a more established asset class. Lithium is a great example. Financing lithium, lithium ion batteries, you know, five years ago was difficult today you can, it's a commodity, you can do it easily. So I think it's really a matter of adoption, proof points, and you know, the, the grid needs based upon renewable penetration. But regulatorily, I think the regulators will support it as they see those dynamics play out. 
Dennis, did you want to add anything to well, that? Because I, I like to push back a little bit for fun, well, just to. <laughs> I, I'm not sure it's a barrier so much as I think you could sort of incentivize long duration storage, and I think a clean uh, peak standard uh, could be used. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sort of thinking off the top of my head here, but if you had a clean peak standard that could encourage long duration storage as opposed to a gas peaker. Um, that that might uh, spur the uh, market a little bit, and then you'd have a business case for the uh, use of that long duration storage. But. I, I'd say one of the other hurdles is that some of the modeling is not speeding up to what all the new technologies are. You can model pumped hydro storage, which is great, and it's it's really you know essential. But at the same time, there are so many different types of batteries and short and long term duration. So how do you increase the model capacity to demonstrate the need and demonstrate proof of concept. And there is the effective load carrying capacity tool, which does a great job to look at duration, but it also is just starting the modeling changes. We need to do more on top of that. And so in addition to the modeling to justify the need, having those procurement signals from the state regulators saying, we want you to purchase this amount of long duration energy storage, geothermal batteries, different types, wind, solar, Having that all out there to really push the market forward helps. I think with the state renewable portfolio standards, we've we're meeting those renewable targets. You know, we we've had our days in Colorado, California, other states where we've gone over 60% of renewable energy integration. And so now we need storage to keep it online. <laughs> so that's a key part. Um, okay, I, I think it's great to to have all these points. And, and both federal and state partnerships are are critical. Um, so then there was another question on um the you know, both kind of bring, I'm going to weave in a couple from, from Mark and Joshua, where we talked about, you know, batteries and pumped hydro storage, you know, are there comparative costs per kilowatt storage? And then are there differences in the hierarchy of storage? Well, the, the, the point about comparative costs uh, is a really great one because it's, it's, it's difficult, right? I mean, pumped hydro, especially if you've got, um, you've got an installation, which has been running you know, for 50, 60 years, and it can be extended and carry on running. Can you really compare that um, cost, you know, per megawatt hour with, with, with a lithium ion battery, let's say that's designed for, for 20, 30 years or, or longer, if you're going to swap out batteries and things. Um, uh, so the answer is it's difficult. And I think really, uh, this is why um, in, you really need a, a holistic approach, taking into account things like the, the physical constraints, um, uh, really trying to to cite to cite technologies in the right place. So, for example, where you've got brownfield sites, where you've got um, old mine shafts, where, where where you might be able to use a, a gravity based technologies, where you do have a natural topography that supports pumped hydro, um, there really needs to be more of a design that that takes all of that into account, and not just purely coming from 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 a cost standpoint. I really liked your answer, Arjun. I mean. There's physical constraints around some of the technologies, and you did a really good job of describing, you know, how those constraints impact their adoption outside of cost. I mean, it all translates to cost at the end of the day. But look, today, if you compare storage technologies, pumped hydro is the lowest cost storage technology if you have the proper environment and, you know, and you have a constituency that wants to have it there. And present. And one thing you can't, you cannot underestimate is the voice of the customers and the constituents when you're putting a technology in place. And by the way, I think it should be that way. That's what this is all about, right? Is trying to service a community of EDSG. So there are definitely some constraints. And I think safety is another one. So there are some technologies that are quite appealing, but people have concerns about the safety associated with that and the environmental impact and also the sourcing impact, which we've already talked about. So I don't want anybody thinking on the call that these decisions are made purely financially. Um, that most certainly is a strong consideration. And I think there was reference made to the LCOE model that's used frequently, but at the end of the day, there are definitely other dimensions and there's a far too, there's a plenty of vendors that will tell you that they have a great low cost solution, but it's not quite ready for adoption for the other reasons. <laughs> Dennis, did you want to add anything? No, I, I'm, I'm good with this. <laughs> on the interest of time, I think we could. <laughs> yeah, great. Well, and, and, and to bring in equity, like who, who pays for this and, and all, all types of customers and to take into consideration that not everyone can afford all the upgrades and how do we then account and be more equitable in those manners, which is key. 
So Zane asks um, from Sightline Institute, um, if you were advising the governor of a medium-sized state, what policy would you recommend to have the greatest impact on speeding up the adoption of renewable energy storage? And I'd like to take the first stab at this as, as moderator to say that you know, it's really having coordinated planning and permitting. Like to have, when everyone says like streamline NEPA, it, it's not that, it's all the different agencies and organizations who have a checklist, how to make sure that this is in a very transparent, knowledgeable manner where you know the steps to do something, you know how it's coordinated to the integrated resource plan, you know how it's gonna work with all the other pieces that are required in your state policies and then have that be coordinated and then kind of facilitate through the process will really help streamline it. So I, I think it's really kind of being able to manage the 10 different heads that are controlling different pieces to get it built, making sure everyone's coordinated and, and working in a more collaborative way with clear roles and responsibilities. I think if I were to add to that, it, look, I would just be really clear, the util local utility company is one of those constituents and prioritizing the implementation of those new resources. So I, I, it probably was implied, Julia answered the question, but I'd add them to the, the 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the second thing is, if you're really serious about ESG and net zero, um, I would take away the incentives for the carbon-based plants uh, responsibly, knowing that you're going to have some constituents and uh, owners that are going to be very uh, biased with respect to that legislation and that policy. But it really comes down to you know, a lot of these plants are fully depreciated or close to full depreciation, even if they're not. Um, they're, they make a lot of money for their owners, but they're contrary to net zero goals and what we're trying to achieve. And so some states are struggling with letting go of incentives or support for those kind of plans. Arjun, I'm gonna ask you another question for um, regarding from Patty from Reclaim Finance about, you know, that this comes up a lot. Can't we just stack lithium ion batteries? Can't we just put four plus four plus four and then get 10 hours? Um, you know, so is, I like that they're asking what's, is there a price point that makes this? Is it, is it adding another bank? What, what makes this work or not work? And um, are prices coming down to make this viable? Thanks. Yeah. So, oh, um, yeah, so uh, it, it can work. You can do it. I think the issue has been really, again, is monetizing that storage. Um, and particularly in, in Europe, I mean, it varies by country to country, but Sometimes you have uh, market regimes which, which, which really don't provide any kind of incentive to have that longer duration um, there available. Um, and but for sure, you know, as as, as time goes on and, and the price of lithium ion comes down, um, we'd expect to see um, additions, capacity additions happening, um, and, and expansions to to plants. And also, there's going to be, potentially there's a whole another source from Second Life batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, potentially of EVs and things. So um, yeah, yeah, that, that's what I'd say. Oh, thank you for that. And I think we're going to see this play out in real time in California this summer. We've already had FEX alerts and we've been able to procure a thousand megawatts of four hour battery storage, but they're not all going to be online. Some will come on in July and some will come on by August and September. And they're going to be pushed and pulled in, in different ways and we've anticipated their use. So it's exciting to see this. We, we need it, we need more, but the duration piece is so essential because you know, using these four hour batteries for like pushing and pulling wears down the durability and the duration. And so we've got to make sure that we've got this in our tool chest plus so many other attributes. So thank you for that question. I want to go to the next one um, that I'll ask the, ask the group um, from um, Electric Drive Africa in Zimbabwe, which are the best modeling tools for microgrids with storage? Wow. I, I mean, I'm not up to date on all the vendors, but well, certainly you have a you have a plethora of uh, microgrid uh, controls companies that you know, there's several of them that that's all they do. And then the second thing I would say to you is a lot of the storage integrators are developing their own tools and their own capabilities that are kind of pri proprietary to their deployments. I don't think. Uh, Microgrid control is an obstacle to the adoption. There, those controls are available commercially either by an integrator. Some of the battery manufacturers are actually going in that direction. And, and, and if you look at the value chain, it's compressing. So I don't, 
I don't have the names right off the top of my head, but we'll certainly uh, don't think there should be a difficult choice. And we can load some of those after the conference. Thank you for that. Again, it's kind of seeing the big picture on how everything kind of plugs and plays together. There's a, a question that's from Rachel from Western Organization of Resource Councils, and it's been seconded by Maya from the Open Road. It's it's a great question about you know how could these storage solutions address environmental justice communities, jobs, and energy access? Well, I, oh, go ahead, Dennis. Yeah. Happy to take the first whack at that, but I mean, one of the things that uh, we've written about a lot at IEFA is about the use of battery storage to replace gas peakers in inner city neighborhoods. Um, New York City is a prime example here. I know there, you know, you can pick on any city you want, but they have a host of 40 plus year old gas peakers that are located predominantly in lower income neighborhoods and they fire up on hot summer days and they run for a couple of hours and they spew out lots of NOx all over the place, nitrogen oxide, sorry, um, and very bad for local air quality. And there is a, a very good case to be made that battery storage could be brought in to boot those um, very seldomly used gas peakers out, out of the market and offline. And you would improve the air quality locally and you would have the same amount of reliability. I mean, there, there's there are many applications like that that are available today. And some of it is getting the price right. And some of it, like Stephen said, is convincing the incumbents that, you know what, you have to let go. It's time to move on to a newer, better technology. And I would add that at making sure that in the RFPs or requests for proposals or further, you know, all these different, add the criteria that this is an essential part to making it work. If you want to build this, you have to have address the questions of how does this support local and disadvantaged communities, environmental justice groups, you know, and what what does the transition look like? There are examples of, around the states, but it it's again important to have advisory committees, local input. Um, it, this is something that is essential to making sure that we meet all of our net zero goals. So I, I'm so well, glad you brought that up. Go ahead, Arjun. Well, the good news oh, is that, you know, energy policy isn't all done at a federal level. It's very much at a local level. So when, you know, I listen to both your suggestions that's all very plausible and possible uh, on a local level. It's just a matter of, you know, political action at a local level, as you said. I think that if I were looking at it from a federal standpoint, and I'm not a political person, I really mean that, but the, the Biden administration has turned uh, this environmental cause um, into a strategic cause and a, and a local cause. And I think when you look at the financing they put in place for these technologies, and where they're the way they're driving it and, and to the the community they're taking this kind of view as well so the good news is it's not just about getting to net zero and ignore the granular detail around the local economics and and you know the justice elements i think they really are trying to incorporate that to the extent they can from a federal level so there's good news coming and to reiterate some specific steps too, that the federal legislation, the state legislation, really mandating the criteria for how this is going to incorporate into the procurement, um, setting up the advisory committees and, and actually adhering and taking their recommendations in consideration. So are there any last comments that you want to make, Arjun or, or Stephen or Dennis, just because I really appreciate that there's so much we could dive into today and storage is such an essential part of being our climate reliability resiliency goals. So I really appreciate all the fantastic questions and the dialogue and look forward to more. Yeah, sure. So, so if I could, Julia, one point I'd make um, again on, on energy um, access, if you like, or, or costs really, um, something we haven't talked about much is just the fact that energy storage in, improves system efficiency overall, which, which really brings down costs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the Hornsdale Battery Reserve in South Australia, um, in the first two years after that was installed, it saved $150 million of frequency control costs for the South Australian grid. So these are costs, these are savings which can be passed on to consumers. Um, but in terms of a, a kind of a, a final message, if you like, uh, one thing I would say is to, you know, I'm sure we've got some campaigners on the call today. You know, energy storage maybe, you know, has not been a kind of a campaign topic uh, per se in the past, um, but I'd really encourage um, campaigners, you know, just to get in touch with your, your, your regional national energy storage associations and just find out what's the situation because it really varies e even, especially within Europe by country a lot. Um, because there are regulatory hurdles. And I think there is also an issue of public awareness, mm -hmm. um, which definitely more could be done um, just to just to raise the profile of energy storage um, with the public. 
I want to say something to the campaigners as well. This is a very practical statement. I live in a very old community. My zip code is 01776. So you get an idea of where I live, right? And one of the big issues for the local community has been a transmission line that the local utility wanted to put in. Yeah. And it was going to go right across all these historic regions. And it really upset the local community. But as campaigners, you, got, you need, as Arjun said, you need to look at energy storage as a solution to some of those local issues. Because with energy storage, you don't need the transmission. So don't be afraid to dig into a little detail. I'm always willing to make myself available. You can solve local issues beyond just energy by using energy storage. And thanks for attending today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again, everyone. So glad you're a part of this today and look forward to um, your you're coming back to have more questions and dialogue and to having um, you know storage be as part of the campaigner. I really appreciate the panel discussion and thank you, Sandy, again so much for you for focusing on storage as part of integral piece to the future of the grid. So appreciate again everyone's great questions, participation, and the opportunity to have this dialogue. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Julia and Dennis and Arjun and Stephen. That was a terrific discussion about the trends in storage and the many factors affecting it and the way it integrates with renewable energy technology. We also thank all of you for the terrific questions today. And we hope that you will stay online here for another 10 minutes and watch the next in our series of videos on local leadership global change. This short film highlights the extraordinary work being done in Poland to move the country away from its historic dependence on coal fired power. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for the final session of our conference, which is called Markets. The energy transition is here. Where are the investors? Also feel free to join any of the side meetings that are listed for tomorrow's agenda. Thanks again and goodbye. My name is Michael Hatmanski and I'm economist and president of the board at Instrat, a Warsaw-based think tank that is focusing on energy transition from coal to clean energy sector in Poland and Central and Eastern Europe. My name is Diana Maciąga and I've been working with a Polish NGO, Pracownia na Rzecz Wszystkich Istot, which is completely unpronounceable, so we translated into Workshop for All Being. For the past 31 years, we've been working for protection of the natural values of our country, Poland, to protect both wild animals and habitats. My name is uh, Ilona Indrasik and I'm leading a fossil fuel infrastructure team in Poland in an organization called ClientEarth. ClientEarth is an international organization which focuses on environmental law. My team focusing on Polish coal issues, all these pollutions which are connected to coal and we are trying to make Polish energy system greener and safer. My name is Sophie Marginak. I'm uh, the Climate uh, Accountability Lead at Client Earth. I'm based in London, but our team works on climate law and litigation all around the world. My name is Kuba Gogoleski. I'm based in a Polish non-governmental organization that's called Fundacja Rozwój Tak Odkrywki Nie. That would be a development, yes, open bit minds no. We are representing a coalition of local communities, local authorities, experts and scientists who since 2011 have been opposing plans to build new lignite mines. And we've been supporting those communities, working on the transformation of a Polish energy system. Our long lasting campaign for coal phase out in Poland started with the first uh, campaign concerned then the biggest uh, new power plant in Europe, the North or Północ. And the campaign was uh, successful. We managed to stop construction of this facility. And later we campaigned to stop construction of the infamous Ostrowenka C coal. Project. Ostrowenka was a symbol. It was the last plant that was decided to be built in the EU. It, the decision was taken after a lot of campaigners, including us, saying that it doesn't have economic sense, that it will never pay off, that it will be a stranded asset. Still, the, the two state-owned utilities decided to start operation, even though they didn't have financing secured. We played a big part in 
reaching out to international insurance and reinsurance companies, explaining what are the faults and problems with this project, and the project was dropped. The biggest argument against Ostrowenka C was actually that this is not anyhow aligned with the European and global climate policy. And uh, we proved with analysis made by experts that this coal power plant block is never going to be profitable for the companies and it should not be built. Luckily, the construction started, but it was dropped. And I think there's a message there. We used to uh, think that when the construction starts, it's usually done deal. Ostrowinka started construction at the end of 2018, and the decision to cancel it was in May 2020. So last year it was abandoned and became sort of a symbol of a stranded asset in the making. We've wasted 250 to 300 million euros on building two, you know, two pillars, and that's just that's the money that didn't go to transformation. Poland is one of the most coal-dependent countries, not only in Europe, but also in the world. And at the moment, we still produce around 70% of our electricity and around 70% of heat from coal. Coal has a significant role, not only in the energy sector as a system, but also uh, when it comes to the individual heating. So we still use coal uh, to burn in domestic stoves. These are very small boilers that have no environmental pollution limits, they are very outdated. The coal used there is a non-classified kind of coal that is very pollutive and Poland has one of the highest number per capita of premature deaths caused by air pollution coming mostly from individual heating. This impact of coal in Poland is visible uh, not only in CO2 emissions but also in the other uh, environmental problems uh, such as uh, landscape, such as protection of soil and protection of water. Public opinion is much, uh, is much divided about the energy transition in Poland. Many people in Poland still consider coal as something very concrete. Your own economic resource, that is coal that you extract from underground, and this underground has been defended by your ancestors. And even two or three years ago, you could hear the president of Poland, Mr. Andrzej Duda, saying that Poland has enough resources to extract and burn coal for the next two centuries. When I started working for Clienterf, the share of coal in the electricity sector was around 80%. And within these 10 years, we actually reduced the coal uh, up to 70%, which is significant, but still is way too much uh, to actually talk about decarbonization of the Polish energy sector. And uh, within these 10 years, we improved significantly development of prosumer's energy, so this micro-scale energy. We significantly improved the energy efficiency, but there is still a lot to do uh, to get rid of coal. Even 40, 50-year-old energy coal power plants are still active and are still producing energy in Poland. Bełchatów is the second biggest lignite coal power plant in the world and the biggest single coal power plant in Europe. It's also the biggest single CO2 emitter in the entire European Union. Bełchatów is lignite coal, so it's not only gigantic, it's also using the dirtiest form of coal, which makes extremely huge impact on the entire environment, on the water regime, on the air pollution, local fauna and flora. We decided to actually make the first civil case against Bohatów power plant in Poland. We used the article from the Polish environmental law and which said that if there is any installation uh, which impact on the environment is big and this impact is impossible to reduce by any technological way, uh, then uh, the, the environmental organization or the local community have a right to actually uh, demand this installation to be shut down. Those last remaining coal power operators are really being squeezed out of the market and then hence we've seen the announcement by the Polish government that they will close Belhatov by 2036, which is not in line with um, the science. As we know, um, coal in the OECD needs to end um, by 2030 at the absolute latest. So uh, that is still too late, 2036, but at least there's an acknowledgement from the government that there needs to be a conversation about a coal phase out, which is a first for Poland. We need to start 
uh, closing coal power plants. And the first uh, step for it would be actually announcing the date of coal phase out. We don't have it in Poland yet. The government will never say uh, it is our brave decision to phase out coal. They will do it step by step. These, these steps are never announced as a coal phase out. So you should read between the lines to see that the government approach is, uh, is changing. And numerous institutes, uh, researchers, analysts, including Instrat, is showcasing different scenarios to switch from coal to other energy carriers and sources. There is this completely uh, different idea for an energy system. We sometimes call it this virtual um, power plant. So it's not one huge facility, but basically every house becomes the producer of energy. It can be done with photovoltaics, uh, with wind, uh, with biogas. The municipalities, so these local communities, can have their own mini renewable power plants. And if we also reduce the use of energy, uh, we can become independent. This also means that people are becoming independent from these big energy corporations, that they uh, reclaim uh, power. <laughs> so uh, it's literally power to the people. And this is also one of the reasons that uh, the government, which controls energy production in Poland, uh, doesn't really want to uh, let go of this power. Uważam, że e, polscy politycy i polityczki zbyt długo są bierni, nie podejmując działań, które będą chroniły nas, obywateli, obywatelki, przed zmianami klimatu. This is a case brought by five Polish people. They are all seeing the effect of climate change in their everyday lives. They are bringing a human rights case to five regional courts in Poland, alleging that Polish personal rights and human rights require the Polish state to reduce its emissions in line with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Zdecydowałam się podjąć działania prawne, dlatego że świat już jest o 1,2 stopnie cieplejszy, jeżeli weźmiemy pod uwagę poziom przedindustrialny. Taki świat jest już katastrofalny. Ja Nie chcę, żeby moja przyszłość też tak wyglądała. Nie chcę, żeby teraźniejszość tych osób też tak wyglądała. Poland really owes it to their citizens to step up to the plate and face the reality that fossil fuels are a relic of the past and that on a pure economic and political level, as a member of the EU, they are holding themselves back by failing to transition at the same pace as the rest of the bloc. I'm partial optimistic in a sense that I know that there is a lot of things that can be done and will be done. But looking at the big picture, I think we really need to speed up. There's still lots to do. We are going to the good green direction, but so far Poland is rather, you know, like crawling than running. So we have to really make them speed up. Mm -hmm.